Well, good evening. Welcome back on this Wednesday night. We're continuing our study of Acts chapter 18. Uh, and we started this at the beginning of the year on our Wednesday night Bible study using uh, the Read, Feed, Lead Acts books and curriculum. Uh, this is a great series. I'd encourage you to read the use the other books. Uh, we've gone through a couple of them as well before in small groups at our church. This Acts one is written by Al Mohler, and this is the study guide. So there's the books and the study guides that go with them. So we are in chapter four in the study guide. Uh, if you still have yours and are using it. Monday night, we talked about uh, verses one through five in Acts chapter 18. But let me go ahead and read through the passage again. This is uh, the coming to the end of the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, recorded in Acts for us. Acts 18, I'll read verses 1 through 11. We're really going to focus tonight in on verses 6 through 11. But let's read through it. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. That was the point. That's the center of, of his message. Verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul on one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So last week we talked about God using <clears throat> even unrighteous governments for his glory as shown in Priscilla and Aquila they they get kicked out of Rome because of an unrighteous emperor Claudius uh, they end out in Corinth but God uses that uh, to introduce them to Paul they go with Paul to Ephesus they meet Apollos in Ephesus and and disciple Apollos a little bit and launch Apollos it's an amazing thing and we talked about the fact that how we share the gospel is also to go to the glory of God. When it says Paul reasoned and tried to persuade them, showing logical consistency uh, and argumentation that itself can go to the glory of God and teach certain truths about God's being and attributes and nature. And then that the point of Paul, the center of Paul's testimony, the center of what he was arguing was that the Christ was Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ. Now, tonight, I want to look at uh, a couple responses to that message from this passage, how Paul responded to their responses, and then I want to um, go through and, and make some points about the sovereignty of God in evangelism in this passage, because I find it incredibly comforting as we share the gospel and seek to do the work of the ministry for the glory of God, that God is sovereign and in control. So first of all, let's look at some of these responses. So Paul in verse 5 is, is testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. In verse 6, you have uh, one response that doesn't surprise us at all. This is certainly not the first time in Acts we've seen this response. It says they opposed and reviled him. They hated the message. They hated him. They opposed him. They fought against him. They argued against it. And they personally hated him because of the message that he was preaching and teaching and, and for what he was arguing. So it doesn't surprise us that that's the response of some. If you look back in Acts chapter 17, verse 32 says that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Uh, mockery is not an uncommon response to the gospel. 
Uh, some people do hate it, and some people will revile it, and will hate those who argue for it. And I think we can see that quite clearly uh, in our culture and in many cultures around the world, where uh, there is a hatred of Christians uh, because of the gospel that Christians are proclaiming uh, that is unique. But this is not new. Uh, there are also some, look in verse 8 though, there are some who believe. Verse 8 says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. And his whole household, it appears, believes in the Lord. So there are some who believe. And then also look in verse 11. He stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God. Uh, God tells Paul in verse 10, I have many in this city who are my people. So from the get-go, we understand that the sovereignty of God, and that's the, the title that uh, Muller uses uh, in his book about this passage. I have many in this city. So we understand that some oppose and revile the gospel, but God uses the gospel to save others. There will be those who believe and are obedient in life and who seek to be discipled, and that's those are the ones whom Paul is investing his time in here. So those are the two responses, right? And in the end of verse 17, at the end of chapter 17, we had kind of three responses. Right? You had those who mocked, those who wanted to put it off and gather more information, and then those who believe. Here, it seems like there's one or the other. You have those who are opposing him and hating him, and then you have those who believe. So what is, what's Paul's response in each case? So, verse 6, those who oppose and revile him, it says, He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And this would have been very clear language to them. They would have understood exactly the point that Paul was making here. In Ezekiel chapter 33, Verses 1 through 5 or 6, we have kind of the same principle. This is God explaining to Ezekiel what he's responsible for and what he's not responsible for. And as the watchman, right, as the Christian called to share the gospel, we're called to share the gospel. The people's response is not within our purview. We're not God. We are not the Holy Spirit. We cannot save anyone. So, so when the Jews respond to uh, Paul with vitriol and he says your blood be on your own heads i am innocent i'm going to the gentiles now they would have remembered what god told ezekiel and this is also elsewhere in the old testament but ezekiel 33 the word of the lord came to me son of man speak to your people and say to them if i bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman and if he sees the sword coming upon the land, and he blows the trumpet and warns the people, so the watchman has done what he's supposed to do, he sees danger coming, he sees the enemy coming, and he alerts them. Then if anyone, verse 4, Ezekiel 33, verse 4, Then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head, not the head of the watchman. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. If he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. And then you have the responsibility of the watchman. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any of them away, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So very clearly here throughout scripture, we have the teaching that we are responsible to repeat the word of the Lord. We are responsible to say what God has told us to say, to faithfully share the gospel and to seek to disciple. People's response to that message is not up to us. We do not have that power. We seek to do it in a way that makes sense, that clearly communicates, that shows those things we talked about Monday night, that show the logic and consistency and glorify God in that presentation as well. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit, it's God himself who saves. So Paul, back to Paul in Acts chapter 18, 
when when they reject him and he says, okay, I've done my part. Your blood is on your own heads. I've, I've faithfully fulfilled the task of sharing the gospel. And now it's up to you to, to repent and believe. But Paul is saying, I'm not going to uh, take responsibility for that, which is only the work of of God. He says, I'm going to go over here to the Gentiles. I'm going to share the gospel with them. So he, so he leaves and he goes next door to the uh, synagogue to, to the guy's house, which had to make him mad. You know it did. And then people believe. So what does he do with the people who believe? Well, they're baptized and then he disciples them. See, there are, there are those who we need to invest deeply in and disciple. And there are those who we just need to share the gospel with. If somebody's rejecting the gospel, then we need to bring every conversation back to the gospel because they can be absolutely spot on with ecclesiology or eschatology or any of those other fancy ologies. But if they're off on the gospel and rejecting the gospel, they're still lost and they need to be saved. So for an unbeliever, it's always a gospel issue. And we always have that conversation about the gospel. For the believer, we dig in and we do Bible studies and we do discipleship and we, we seek to wrestle with those deeper questions of the faith. So he responded to those who rejected him by saying, fine, I've been faithful here. I've shared the gospel with you. I'm moving on to the Gentiles. He, he knew what he was and wasn't responsible to do, right? He wasn't there to convince them. That was, that, that's God's task. God is the one who saves. God is the one who removes the heart of stone and grants the heart of flesh, to use the Old Testament analogy again. And Paul understood that he wasn't a salesman. He wasn't about to close the sale. And that's what's, that's what's interesting because we need to make sure that we don't rely upon manipulation or atmosphere or sales technique to try to right, uh, save somebody. Because again, that's not our job. And secondly, that's not how God works. And worse than that, we can, if we use some of those false manipulative techniques, uh, give, end out sharing a false gospel, which is horrific. And then secondly, we could end out giving somebody false assurance, right? Giving somebody a confidence that they are saved when they're not. When God hasn't done the work, they've just been relying upon an emotional feeling or, or, or something else other than the work of God in their life for their salvation. Anything, relying upon anything other than the grace of God is a false gospel. So Paul understood what was his responsibility, what wasn't his responsibility. And those who believed were baptized and he discipled those. And those who were hating him and responded with vitriol, he moved on from after completing the task God had given him, which is to just share the gospel. So we see their responses to the gospel. Some believed and some hated him. We see Paul's responses to their responses, which is just to, to move on and to continue to share the gospel. He didn't allow their response to, uh, to stop him from his faithful task, which God had given him. He didn't allow their response to keep him from being faithful to the task which God had given him. Al Mohler put it this way in his book. He said, God calls his people to faithfulness, not necessarily fruitfulness. He wrote, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot save any other person from their sin. Only God can work salvation. Our job, our calling, our mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do this unapologetically and boldly and offer the gospel to all people. See, that's our task. And then to those who believe, it doesn't stop there either, right? Salvation is not the end of the Christian life. It's just the beginning. And then it's growing in faith and growing in faithfulness and the spiritual disciplines and enjoying walking with God through this life. Now, the other main topic I want to discuss tonight is really looking at verses 9 and 10 and thinking about God's sovereignty in all of this. God is absolutely sovereign. He is in control of all things. And he comes to Paul one night in a vision, verse 9 says, and he says these things. He says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you 
and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And then verse 11 says that Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So we think about God's sovereignty in all of this and understanding, again, confessing that we are not God. We are not sovereign. We are dependent upon the sovereign God. And God has sovereignly commissioned us to speak the gospel. God has ordained the means by which people are saved to be redeemed sinners sharing the gospel with other sinners and praying for God to redeem them. Right? God has chosen in his goodness and in his sovereignty to use the church, that's us, to share the gospel that he will use to save those who are his. So God in his sovereignty has commissioned us to speak. So he says, don't be afraid. Don't allow fear to paralyze you. And remember, we read um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 last week where Paul said in verse 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. But he continued to share the gospel. He didn't allow the weakness and the fear and the trembling to keep him from being obedient to what God had called him to do. So God says, don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be afraid. Do not be silent. Acts 18 verse 9 says, so that's the, the command for the people of God to speak the gospel of God and to not be coward or intimidated, to not allow people's responses to tempt us to either not share the message or change the message. We as believers don't have the right to do either of those things. We will continue to speak what God has revealed through Scripture. So God sovereignly has commissioned us to speak. And we also see his sovereignty in the fact that he's with us. Look at verse 10. He says, for I am with you. It's, it's, it's the very presence of God that gives the people of God confidence in the task that God has given us. Paul's not to be afraid because God's with him. The presence of God makes all the difference. It doesn't mean that everything's easy. We know that Paul's going to die for the faith later. We know that he's going to be martyred for the faith. We know that those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We know that if we speak the purity of the gospel, we will be hated by some. But God says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Jesus said that he would never leave us or forsake us. At the Old Testament, we have the promise as well. You remember the, uh, the psalm where the psalmist says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? It's not because the valley of the shadow of death isn't scary. It absolutely is. It's not that it's not difficult. Of course it is. It's not that it's not painful. It is painful. But the psalmist says, Though he walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will not fear evil. Why? Because thou art with me, your rod and thy staff, they comfort me, right? So, so again, it's, it's the very presence of God that gives the people of God confidence to fulfill the tasks that God has given us. He's with us. So we can be faithful. Though everybody else hate us, God's with us. Though everybody else revile against us, God is with us eternally. And he'll see us through. So we have the very presence of God, which which is so comforting and makes all the difference as God's people. God also, we see his sovereignty in that he limits what we endure. He protects us. Here he says, I'm with you. No one will attack you to harm you. Now God's giving Paul this promise in this city at this time. We know that later he's killed for the faith. But at this time in this city, God says, um, no one will attack you. No one will harm you. And God can make that promise sovereignly because he is in control of all that happens to us and within our lives. The sovereignty of, and we remember Job in the Old Testament. God called Job to endure some incredibly difficult things, but he limited them and he walked with him through them, which again makes all the difference. So we see God's faithfulness and his sovereignty as he is the one who protects us and he's the one who limits what we endure. So how can we know that we can endure and persevere? Because it's the power of God and the promise of God limiting what we endure 
uh, that gives us that assurity, that assurance, knowing that uh, we will be victorious, not because it's us, but it's Christ in us. And then he, he says something sweet here also to Paul in verse 10. He says, for I have many in this city who are my people. This is God saying, Paul, keep sharing the gospel because I'm going to save some people around here. Paul, share the gospel because I have many in this city who are mine. And God already knew their name and he already ordained their salvation. He already knew how it was going to come about. And he had already called Paul there to speak the words that the Holy Spirit was going to use to affect salvation for those people's eternities. It's an amazing thing. It's the sweetness of the sovereignty and the goodness and the grace of God on display. So it's the boldness we have in evangelism is not boldness in my being able to choose words or convince anybody. It's just speaking the truth of the gospel, knowing that God is a God who saves. So our confidence in uh, mission, missions work worldwide is that God has promised there will be people from every people group who will be saved. Ultimately, the gospel will go worldwide and people from every people group will be saved based upon the sovereignty, the sure promise, and the power of God to bring those things about. So this is just the sweet grace of God reminding Paul, don't be afraid, Paul. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. You're going to be okay here in this moment. I'm going to protect you right now. And there's going to be people who are saved. There are believers here whom you need to disciple, Paul. And he, and he does that. So we likewise need to rest in the sovereignty of God. We need to understand the sweet truthfulness, the, the sweet doctrine that is the sovereignty of God. You see, Paul knew what he was and wasn't responsible for. Paul knew his task was to share the gospel, that it was going to be the power of God applied to the person as to whether or not that person responded with true faith and repentance. Al Mohler again said, The work of salvation, however, belongs in the sovereign hands of God. We can therefore preach with confidence, knowing that we cannot fail. We only fail if we remain silent. So it's not up to me to manipulate, to convince, to do the hard sell, uh, and to think that that actually saves anyone. My job is to, to the glory of God, speak the gospel, make much of Christ and salvation offered in Christ. Christ crucified for the sins of all who believe, the righteousness of Christ given to his people. And then we are called to enjoy the life lived for God and being faithful to God for eternity. So part of that, think about how miserable it would be. To, I could never be a pastor if I didn't have confidence in this doctrine. Think about how miserable it would be if you thought that somebody else's eternal destiny was dependent upon your work or your ability to convince. It's, it's a horrific, it's a horrific doctrine. It's a lie. It's not in scripture anywhere. That's the point of this. Uh, but it's also true that the truth is freeing. The truth is so, so liberating because it just motivates us to faithfulness. And then when we know what, what our task is and we know where God's task begins, then we let God be God. I need to be faithful to what God has called me to do. And God's going to do what he's going to do. I can't control people's responses. Uh, I can't control uh, who repents and believes and who doesn't. God controls all of that. And it's for his glory. And then we knew, see, Paul knew that God had people for him to disciple there. God told him that there were going to be people who were going to believe. And his task was to invest himself in those believers. To give himself at that time. We know there's time for gospel ministry and there's time for discipleship. And at that time, God was calling Paul to disciple those believers. So we need to be discipled and we need to disciple as well. We need to continue to grow in the faith. He was there a year and six months discipling them. This is not a short-term process. This will go on for the rest of our lives. And I believe and would argue even into eternity for the glory of God. But there's much peace in knowing that God is sovereign. And we are absolutely responsible to repent and to believe and to walk in faithfulness to what God has revealed to us. And we are absolutely called uh, to let God be God. 
And I think that's why Paul can have peace here when he says, okay, I've shared the gospel with you, now I'm going to the Gentiles. There's other people who need to hear, and there's other people whom God's going to use me to speak the gospel to who are going to believe and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would make us an evangelistic people. Give us within our heart the desire to share the gospel. May we do so in a way that glorifies you, the right method and the right motive. Uh, obviously, Lord, may the message be clear that it's salvation through faith in Christ's work. Father, we pray that you would help us to relinquish control of those things that we try to control and, and understand that there are certain things that only you can do. And Father, when we think about our own salvation and our own life, we're thankful that you did intervene, that you did grant us faith, that you did grant us belief and favor and repentance. And Father, I'm thankful that you've You've done that work, and I pray that you would continue to help us to uh, enable us to celebrate as we see that work being accomplished in others as well. Give us the courage to speak the gospel for your glory. May we always be seeking to grow in the faith as well and be discipled and to think more clearly and rightly about things, to love more boldly, and to speak the gospel um, with love and kindness and clarity. And I pray that you continue to mold us into a community of believers. Um, tied together, tied to you for eternity. Um, again, as always, for your glory. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.